I, I took the time to write something here. I'd like to read it. So I don't, I really want to say a few things about John that maybe some of you don't know. For many of our registrants of this symposium, John Thorne needs no introduction. But for those newer to Sabre and some of our 19th century committee happenings, John Thorne is most often and too simply described as Major League Baseball's official historian of post years held for nearly a decade. More appropriately for our purposes, he is also the co-founder and former first co-chair of the 19th Century Committee, which came into existence in 1982, just over a decade after the founding of SABA. In addition to his many books, encyclopedias, articles, blogs, and talks regarding baseball and other sports, John's seminal work, Baseball in the Garden of Eden, which I have right here somewhere, John. <laughs> Something everybody should have. <laughs> uh, I too. <laughs> the secret history, the secret history of the game of the early game. That's the subtitle. Uh, published in uh, 2011 by Simon and Schuster, is really a touchstone for serious researchers in 19th century baseball. Since 2009, with our committee's first 19th century baseball conference at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, which in the following year became the Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference was simply the thread in memory of that highly respected 19th century baseball researcher who died suddenly after that first conference. John has been part and parcel to our Cooperstown conferences ever since. At that first conference, John served as a panelist uh, as a panel member in a discussion on researching, writing, and publishing baseball history, a discussion moderated by Frederick Ivan Campbell. John also graciously accepted our invitation to perform double duty that year as the keynote luncheon speaker, um, uh, which was a very enthralling presentation. For the next 10 Fred conferences at the Hall of Fame, John again agreed, graced us as moderator, uh, of our panel discussions, often inviting persons doing cutting edge historical research. Last April, he again accepted an invitation to be our luncheon speaker, providing an interesting retrospective of the last decade or so of 19th century baseball research. Finally, John has been directly instrumental in all four of our past uh, city specific 19th century baseball interdisciplinary symp symposiums. In 2014, in New York City as panel moderator, and 2016, Philadelphia, 2018, Cleveland, 2019, Minneapolis, and now 2021, providing the welcoming address at each city. Uh, please welcome John Thorne. Thank you. John, I'll turn it to you. Let me uh, jump right in. Lieutenant Ambury, writing to a friend in England under date of October 30, 1781, refers thus to Charles Loosley's King's Head Tavern, also known as Brooklyn Hall. Quote, on crossing the East River from New York, you land at Brooklyn, which is a scattered village consisting of a few houses. At this place is an excellent tavern where parties are made to go and eat fish the landlord of which has saved an immense fortune during this war. While the British occupied Brooklyn, horse races were more or less regularly held on the old course around Beaver Pond near Jamaica, at New Lots, and at Flatlands not far from the ferry. They were largely attended by the army officers and the people of New York, who crossed over on the ferry and, no doubt, added greatly to the profits of the King's Head. Loosely had a ball field owner's entrepreneurial bent, not unlike that of Bill Kammeyer of the Union Pond, which ultimately became the enclosed baseball field. Of a sponsored horse race, he warned, it is expected that no person will attempt to erect a booth on the race ground without first subscribing at least three guineas, neither to sell wines, liquors, etc., from wagons and other carriages, without subscribing two guineas toward the saddle, bridle, and whip to be run for each day, and other expenses attending the races. 
This notice was signed, God Save the King, and dated Brooklyn Hall, February 10, 1781. Loosely often prefaced his announcements of his sporting affairs with the motto pro bono publico, encouraging not only participants and betters, but even mere spectators. Amazingly, these broadsides survived to testify that Brooklyn and sport grew up together. On August 9, 1779, he took an advertisement in the New York Mercury. Quote, a set of gentlemen proposed playing a cricket match this day and every Monday during the summer season on the cricket ground near Brooklyn Ferry. The company of, quote, any gentleman to join the set in the exercise is invited. A large booth is erected for the accommodation of spectators. Sometimes he closed his notices with warnings that rebels should not approach nearer than Flatbush Wood. Once the American victory seemed assured, however, Loosley declared bankruptcy and headed to, quote, the promised land of Nova Scotia with brother loyalists where freedom and liberty reigned triumphant. There, he opened another tavern, if not on the same principles, of sporting events promoting comestibles and potables, or vice versa. What does all this have to do with baseball, you may wonder? In which Brooklyn arguably gave birth in the 1850s and 60s. Everything, as I will proceed to lay out. Just as England gave us baseball itself in rudimentary form, so did it shape the sporting appetites of Brooklyn. A bit belatedly, some preliminary niceties. Let me note Ralph Carhart's prior presentation so agreeably commenced at about the point where I will end. Let me also acknowledge Peter Mancuso, not only for his kind words about me, but also for his pioneering of the interdisciplinary concept, so apt for the Sabre crowd. As Peter noted, I have addressed the four previous such conferences, and I expect Brooklyn will be my swan song. Thanks also to Tom Gilbert, author of a fine new book, who will lead this afternoon's panel into an exploration of baseball's birthplace a point of enduring and to me fascinating contention. My task should have been a snap, a welcoming talk to an audience that largely knows me, or at least my work. But instead it became a joyf joyfully arduous expedition down a rabbit hole, as research has been for so many of us here. Writing is the hard part as we all know. I realized some time ago after committing to speak today on a subject to be determined that I knew precious little about Brooklyn sport prior to the 1860s, except for stray newspaper references to baseball that now and then I had shared with the protoball group. By the way, profound props to that noble effort, which like Retrosheet has put flesh on the bones of a story that fans thought they already knew. So, off and on for several weeks now, I have steeped myself in the history of Brooklyn and its formidable neighbor across the East River, about which I already knew a thing or two. Focusing on amusements and their prohibitions, the latter so illuminating about the ethos of the community, I now make bold to share with you a rambling highlight reel of the riches I have found. What is our starting point? For New York, it is the Dutch attitude toward sport of the 17th century, followed by the more straight-laced and class-bound proclivities of the English. For Brooklyn, we must start a century later, in the pre-revolutionary period. Its horse racing, cricket, and blood sports will mark our beginnings for today, with some bouncing between the banks of the river that separates the two cities. I will not have cause to use the word borough going forward. As I've decided to end my talk well before the birth of the megalopolis known as Greater New York dating to 1898. 
the sporting milieu in New York City into which baseball intruded forcibly in the mid 1830s. Racing, yachting, rowing, ten pins, pedestrianism, boxing, and canine and cockfighting arose from the materialism, personal solitude, and risque lures of the city's bachelor culture. Rural youths with no prospects flocked to the city after 1825 when the completion of the Erie Canal made New York, not Philadelphia or Baltimore or New Orleans, the nation's economic capital. The milieu for diversion in Brooklyn, less caught up in imports from the hinterland or in financial speculation, was still found in fishing, hunting, and the field sports inherited from loosely and is not yet forgotten British compatriots. By 1845, New York, its northernmost region rising with each generation from the Battery to what would become Central Park, had seen its playing grounds give way to the needs of the railroad. In less densely populated Brooklyn, however, the advent of rail only enhanced the appetite for sport. By 1837, stations of the newly organized Long Island Railroad had been built alongside the entrances to race courses old and new. Jamaica, dating to Loosley's heyday, Union, Centerville Trotting Grounds, and in 1855, Fashion Race Course, whose station name would be subsequently styled as West Flushing and in 1872, Corona. Let me break in with a tidbit or sidebar. The Union race course laid out in 1821, and site of the great victory by eclipse over Sir Henry two years later, was owned by Aaron Burr, who in 1833 sold it to Alexander L. Botts of Virginia, the father of Jane Botts, who would become Henry Chadwick's wife. Charles Peverelli described the situation of the ball players who would become Knickerbockers, driven from Madison Square Park in New York by the first Grand Central Station. And I quote, at a preliminary meeting, it was suggested that as it was apparent they would soon be driven from Murray Hill, some suitable place should be obtained in New Jersey where their stay could be permanent. Accordingly, a, a day or two afterwards, enough to make a game assembled at Barclay Street Ferry, at Barclay Street Ferry, crossed over, marched up the road, prospecting for ground on each side, and they reached the Elysian Fields, where they settled. But why, I ask, in 1845, did they go to Hoboken rather than to Brooklyn? Let me suggest that Hoboken, not yet a city, had long earned its reputation as a pleasure garden tailored to the likes of aspiring, if not actual, gentlemen, i.e. white collar workers. While Brooklyn was a city of laborers and farmers, as well as pietists and roughnecks, the last name would soon enough characterize Hoboken as well. Both Hoboken and Brooklyn might have been viewed as satellite communities of New York suburbs, if you will. But the boys who may have played baseball in Brooklyn at that time would go on to become shipwrights and mechanics, not brokers and clerks. For young men, base was a bat and ball game of indistinct rules in Brooklyn, noted by the Long Island farmer in 1835, just as it had been played on Manhattan Isle in 1805 by the lads of Columbia College. Allow me to insert another sidebar. The Knickerbocker Baseball Club formed on September 23rd, 1845. 13 days later, they played their first intramural game, seven on seven, at the Elysian Fields. On June 19, 1846, they played what Hoboken has proclaimed to be the first match game, that is, the first game between two distinct ball clubs. Yet on April 13th, two months earlier, the Knicks had traveled to Brooklyn to play baseball with the Union Star Club, which had played against the New York Ball Club in Hoboken in 1845. 
A rainstorm prevented this April date from supplying what many have termed the first match game. Even then in the 1840s, when cholera had displaced yellow fever as the prevalent epidemic, Brooklyn still viewed New York as a cesspool of disease, vice, and depravity and their merited consequences. At auction in 1784, the year after the British evacuation of New York, John Stevens had purchased the confiscated Tory property that would become the Elysian Fields. Not until 1849, though, would Hoboken be formalized as a residential township, despite decades of fitful development. Stevens had set up the Elysian Fields in response to yellow fever in 1798, and again in 1822, as a summer theme park for fashionable gents fearful of New York's pestilential crowd. Brooklyn, on the other hand, was fairly clear of infection. Gabriel Furman noted in 1824, during the prevalence of the yellow fever in the city of New York in the summer of 1822, seven persons died of that disease in Brooklyn. It was introduced from the city of New York. Indeed, the high and airy situation of Brooklyn almost precludes the idea of its being engendered among us. Echoes of Trump and China here. Today, we think of the two as the rivals they would become by the Civil War. In 1860, Brooklyn was the nation's third largest urban center. But the city of churches had begun as a rural adjunct, like Hoboken, with sleepy concerns for its future quite different from those of New York. In the first national census of 1790, and here I'm going to be recapping part of what Ralph presented, New York had been the nation's largest city as it has been ever since, with 33,000 residents. Brooklyn counted in at some 4,500. By 1830, New York's population burgeoned to 202,000. Brooklyn's grew as well to about 20,000. In 1850, as those who had fought the revolution went to their reward and baseball was poised to stand alongside cricket as a national game, the comparative figures were 515,000 to 139,000. Brooklyn's population had nearly tripled in the past 10 years alone. By 1860, it doubled again. New York would always be larger, but Brooklyn was growing faster. Only 30 years before, Brooklyn residents had numbered one-tenth of those in New York. In 1860, its population was one-third of its rival. If Brooklyn saw Gotham as a den of iniquity, New York viewed the people of Brooklyn as hayseeds, with quaint, quaint customs and beliefs and a deep distrust of newcomers. What may have bound the cities together in something they could agree about was neither the nature of their commerce nor the expression of their creed, but sport. First cricket and horse racing, and the lamentable blood sports involving bulls, bears, cocks, canines, and rats, and after a while, baseball. In Dutch New York, sport was encouraged or at least tolerated except on the Sabbath. Among Governor Peter Stuyvesant's various prohibitions, the one of October 26, 1656, will give an idea of what was permitted six days of the week. Ordinary labor was banned on the Sabbath, but so were pleasures regarded as profanations. Hunting and fishing, whether for commerce or fun, were prohibited on pain of forfeiting one pound Flemish for each person. Moreover, a double fine was prescribed for any lower or unlawful exercise or amusement, drunkenness, frequenting taverns or tippling houses, dancing, playing ball, cards, trick track, tennis, cricket, or nine pins, going on pleasure parties in a boat, car, or wagon, before, between, or during divine service. Time for a sidebar. Bowling 
Or keggling meant a game of nine pins, not 10. Nine pins have been banned periodically to place a check on gambling and boozing. But the saloon keepers and lane proprietors got around the ban by creating the 10 pin configuration. When the Knickerbocker Bowling Saloon opened in 1840 as the first indoor alleys, 10 pins were featured. Back to our Dutch. Mrs. Schuyler Van Rensselaer writes in her history of the city of New York in the, seventh, in the 17th century. With small success, apparently, the governor and council issued ordinances against firing guns, beating drums, and selling liquor on New Year's Day and May Day, against the erection of maypoles as likewise conducive to disorderly conduct, and against the rough sport called pulling or riding the goose. Maypoles were phallic symbols of fertility, and in the eyes of clerics, the abandoned demeanor around them inspired licentious conduct. Dance and sport and pleasure were all wrapped up in one irreligious bundle. Robert Henderson opened his classic Ball, Bad, and Bishop with these words. It is the purpose of this book to show that all modern games played with bat and ball descend from one common source, an ancient fertility rite observed by priest kings in the Egypt of the pyramids. So maypoles and blood sports and baseball have something in common. Horse racing came in during the year after the Dutch first ceded New York to the British in 1665. Taking place at the New Market Course on Long Island, this first racing meet in North America was overseen by New York's new colonial governor, Richard Nichols. Even when Manhattan was narrowly populated, racing was a sport that might attract spectators and betters. It would be dispatched to Brooklyn or Queens or Long Island. Trotting races along the Bowery came in later with upper-class clubmen betting on drivers plucked from the lower social classes. A cricket match by London, Marylebone Row Rules, was played in New York between sides of Englishmen on April 29th, 1751. This day, a great cricket match is to be played on our commons by a company of Londoners against the company of New Yorkers. The game was played for a considerable wager, there being 11 players on each side, according to the London method Forgive me. And those who got most notches in two hands to be the winners. The New Yorkers won by a total of 167 to 80. This was followed up by Marlebone governed matches in Brooklyn in June of 1820, Union Club versus Mechanic Club, both from New York and both comprised of Englishmen. And again in 1838 and 1839 between the between the Long Island and New York sides. Playing for the Lower, which shortly thereafter became the St. George Cricket Club with headquarters at the Bloomingdale Road and 29th Street in Manhattan, was Samuel Wright, father of Baseball Hall of Famers Harry and George, and their brothers Sam and Dave as well. I spotted a lone mention of John Brooks's Cricket Club in an 1825 advert but nothing beyond the The contests held at Lucy's King's Head Tavern in the late 1770s had been arranged on the fly, but as with the London rules matches, the end game was gambling, which in itself was not the perceived evil. It was other people's pleasure. Gambling is the foundation of organized sport for adults. Boys become men and begin to lead serious, calculating lives, as in business. To justify their continuing interest in a youthful pleasure, they must inject purpose into it, as in taking a reasoned risk, making money or honorably losing it. The love of sport as boys became the art and science of sporting men. The wager was all. 
The by now familiar loosely sponsored not only the catches catch can cricket matches of 1779 to 1782, but also the great horse race at Ascot Heath in 1781. This was Brooklyn's first mass sporting event and was memorialized not only in contemporaneous print, but even long after in a lengthy S post facto reminiscence with fictional thrillers in the scrap table book of 1831. Cricket endured as the favored pastime of even some of the most celebrated players of a modern day. Johnny Holder of the Excelsior is a fashion race course home run hero, played for the Long Island Cricket Club. And Jim Creighton clean bowled five wickets out of six successive balls in an 1860 match against Englishmen. Sidebar. The Excelsiors were bitter at the Atlantic and Eckford Club's slight to their players in the selection process for the Brooklyn side in the fashion race course games, as gentlemanless, gentlemanliness seemed to yield before betting interests. This is what gave rise to fairly blatant professionalism in the 1860s, as the Excelsiors supplied cash under the table to Jim Creighton and George Flanley and other clubs followed suit. Skating had been enjoyed by Brooklyn lads in the 1840s on the mill ponds where nary a lady skater was to be seen. No fair one ever dared to take the ice, according to Chadwick. But in 1860, after the Central Park Lake had opened, a furor set in for the sport. First came the Washington Pond, then the Nassau, the Union, the Capitoline, the Satellite, and fatefully for baseball, the Union Skating Club. Along the way there developed on both sides of the East River before the debut of the Great Bridge, a rage for speed in sport, arising from the locomotive to the telegraph to record-breaking feats of even the most mundane and to our eyes, absurd sort. Sports such as oyster and clam opening, pipe setting, quail eating, newspaper folding, butchering, horseshoe turning, soft boiled egg eating. What have I left to one side for reasons of time and space? Wrestling, sparring, points, because they are dull. Billiards, which became popular so rapidly that by the 1850s, a table in the front parlor was the mark of a gentleman, not a, a rapscallion. And rowing and yachting, notably the stories of George Steers and Frank Pigeon. But I have written about both in some depth. And while rowing was sufficiently popular in Brooklyn for a club to have sprung up in 1838, no Brooklyn Yacht Club came into being until 1857, 13 years after the founding of the New York Club. By this time, Steers' ship building exploits culminating in the America's Cup victory of 1851 had made him a transatlantic hero and Brooklyn a city of international renown. Thank you. <laughs> I, would, I would say that that is a, uh, more than a snapshot <laughs> of New York's and Brooklyn's sporting history. It, it, it's a truly amazing job. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to add? Uh, you can do so on the chat button. I can reiterate them. Let's see what happens. Uh, oh, so Tom is saying uh, your copy of John's book is much better shape than, <laughs> than his. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I give it a read. I didn't take any notes or do any highlighting. Uh, Tom says, wow, Murray says, wonderful. And, and it took until 1983 for Perth to wrest away the America's Cup. That's from David Dyke. Yes, Dyer. that's right. 1851 <laughs> to 1983, not bad. I wonder why you said that, David. <laughs> Murray Bouchard, uh, will you make the next available in game in some form, will you make the text available in some form of what you just read? Yeah, yeah, I plan to post it next week to our game 
in illustrated fashion. I thought it inappropriate for a so-called welcoming talk to present a PowerPoint accompaniment. Um, Ralph did a great job with his, but his was a research presentation. Mine was supposed to give you some foundation for what is to follow this afternoon. And I thought there would be nothing better than describing this uh, terra incognito of Brooklyn sport before 1850. Yes, and John did alert you to that fact that that will be a part of his Our, uh, our Game blog. Is that right, John? That is correct. Right. Well, the, uh, Eric says, very good. Uh, Murray says, sweet. Always a pleasure to listen to Great Job Dawn uh, from Ian Braun. And uh, Joe Mancuso, thanks to Ralph and John for a stellar opening of the symposium. So I guess that about says it. John, thank you very much. I know you did. I know, in a, in a sense, you did um, <laughs> discuss this being your perhaps last appearance as a welcoming address. But before you say so again, <laughs> wait until I tell you where the next one is. <laughs> if it's not in Catskill, New York, <laughs> count me out. Well, thank you again, John. Thank you, Pete.